Hey everybody.
All right, it's uh, 5.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone, how's everyone doing today? Welcome back from spring break, by the way. How's everyone's spring break? Needed, very much needed. Yes, yes, always, always needed. And always needed and always too short, right? It's uh, oh. never, never long enough to do everything that, that you want. But, uh, but hopefully everyone was able to get at least a, a quick breather. Um, you know, it's, it's more kind of a breathing break than, uh, than a spring break more than anything. Uh, but how was yours? It was good. Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, got, I got caught up with work a little bit, caught up with, uh, with sleep, caught up with rest, um, you know, got to cook a little bit. And so, you know, did a little bit of everything, which is, which is nice. Um, I got my second dose of the vaccine on, on Sunday too. And so, um, if I'm a little bit out of it today, um, I was actually okay. I've been okay most of the day actually, but now the, the fatigue is starting to hit me a little bit. So if I'm a little bit out of it today, then, then, um, then I apologize for that. Uh, okay, um, and so today, uh, you know, we we spent, you know, I think, you know, right before the spring break, we, we spent quite a bit of time talking about CFP. Um, so basically, how to set, you know, what CFP is in general, and how to set one up as an ambassador. And so um, today, starting today, and you know, for the next few weeks, you know, we're going to really dive back into the theory because uh, you know we haven't really done this um, since we did LPMs, um, and we're really going to be doing you know a lot of kind of theory based stuff, right? And so. Next few weeks, it's you know, mathematically and kind of conceptually, it's it's going to be a little bit intense. You know, I'll uh, you know I'll, I'll warn you guys a bit about that, uh, but you know, hopefully, it's going to be really really interesting as well. Because I have you know I have a lot of cool demos to plan for you guys, um, and the homework that I've posted on online right now is it should be should be fun too. Right? Okay. Um, and so you know, with that, you know, I, I do want to announce that I, I posted the next homework, although um, it, it's mostly going to cover stuff that we're going to go over the next two weeks, and so. Um, that homework's not going to be due for, for three weeks from now. So uh, it's actually going to be due on the same day that your geometric models are, are due. So that's going to be due on April 23rd. Okay. Um, so make sure you have it on your radar. Make sure, you know, you kind of take a look at it. Um, and then as we kind of, you know, go through the theory over the next couple of weeks, then you can start to try to do it. Okay? Um, I think the one problem that you can probably do right now is, is problem three on the homework. Because uh, really problem three on, on that homework is kind of set up for problem four. Um, and so if you, you can, you can start with problem three right now, um, and then see, see how far you can get with that. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you guys have covered this concept before, but problem three and problem four utilizes the concept of recursion. Um, and so what you'll see is that you'll be using a, a recursive function call, uh, within MATLAB in order to, uh, compute the total resistance from like a, from like a very complex vascular tree, right? And so it's, it's a fun assignment, um, or it depends, it depends on, uh, um, how, how much you like recursion, how much you like programming. And so some people think recursion is like the worst thing in the world. Some people think recursion is like, it's like super cool. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it depends on how, it depends on, you know, how, how, how much you like that. Depending on how much you like that, that's going to affect your enjoyment. On the homework. But I'm hoping, you know, the homework will at least be interesting and fun. Um, and of course, you know, you can always come and ask me if you're struggling with anything. Um, okay, and uh, another reminder that I want to make is that, um, you know, I want you definitely want you guys to be working on your projects, you know, as we, um, you know, as, as we keep going along, right. And so I know a lot of you guys are, are progressing really well in your projects. So I, I've seen quite a bit of your geometries already, you know, they're looking great. Um, but I think, you know, some people still um, have not chosen the um, a final project yet. Um, oh, and I see a uh, um, Couple of people just added their names to the spreadsheet. So after the class, after class today, I'll send you your um, your image data. Uh, but if you haven't signed up for your project, you know, definitely go and do that on the on the spreadsheet. Make sure you do that, and then make sure you're starting to work on your geometries um, already too. Right? And so some of you guys, you know, especially some of you with a order models, your geometry may not be that complex. But if you're working on kind of a, a more complex model, you know, it's it's going to take you a bit of time to 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 put your geometry together. So make sure you're kind of working on. Um, okay, so any questions on um, anything before we, we get started today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. And so uh, today we're starting a whole new topic, a whole new unit, and this is going to be on the 1D blood flow equation. And so to kind of start, or to kind of introduce this idea of, of 1D blood flow equations, let me let me kind of draw this uh, this kind of pseudo chart for you. So it's it's not a real chart, but it's it's kind of how I kind of visualize this in my head. Okay. 
Um, because up to this point, you know, we've you know, the uh, kind of taking a step back, you know, the, the title of this class is computational um, cardiovascular engineering, right? And so what, what that entails basically is, you know, we're going over different computational methods uh, to simulate blood, right? And so, um, you know, we've gone over two methods so far. And so we've gone over LPMs, which is our lump parameter circuit modeling. Um, and we've, all, we've also gone over CFD, which is computational fluid dynamics, right? Um, and these kind of represent kind of the two extremes uh, in terms of kind of modeling, uh, modeling options that you have. Right? And let me kind of illustrate what that means, right? And so um, on the x-axis of this graph, let me kind of label this as computational cost. Okay. Uh, and then the y-axis of this graph, I'm gonna label it as, um, you know, accuracy, okay? Or I should say, um, yeah, let's, let's call it accuracy. Okay. And so, you know, if we kind of um, define LPMs, okay. LPMs are kind of down here on, on this region of the graph, right? And so LPMs, you know, in terms of computational costs, they're basically almost none, right? And so remember, LPMs are governed by differential equations. And we can solve those in MATLAB like, like that. And so they're, they're basically taking no time to solve. Um, but the drawbacks of using LPNs is that they're, they're not as accurate. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're not able to get a fine amount of spatial resolution, right? And so when we solve for things like flows and pressures in an LPM uh, or LPM, uh, we can only do those at discrete points, basically just wherever our inductors, wherever our capacitors work, right? And so that's, that's kind of a big drawback of, of that method. Um, you know, um, where, you know, it doesn't cost a lot, you know, it's cheap to do, it's cheap to implement, um, but, you know, you just don't really, often you don't get um, super useful and super accurate information. For that. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you have CFD, right? And so CFD is kind of on the upper right of this graph where, you know, in terms of accuracy, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's no beating CFD, right? And so CFD, you're basically running a three-dimensional um, you know, um, simulation of food flow. And so you're so basically solving average scope in 3D geometry. Um, and so in terms of spatial resolution and time resolution, nothing's gonna beat CFD because it's, it's, it's up there at the top, right? The downside to running CFD is that it's, it's insanely expensive, right? And so, um, you know, what most of you guys are seeing, um, you know, if you have a mesh that has a pretty decent amount of elements, you know, let's say, let's say at least, you know, 500, 600,000, you can't run that on your desktop computer and, and expect that to be and expect your computer to be happy about that, right? And so what we learned kind of right before the break is that you know for these CFD simulations, you have to you kind of have to run them on a supercomputer in order to um, you know in order to kind of get useful results in that in a, in a in a practical amount of time, right? And a lot of times that's that's not an option, right? And so a lot of times you're not going to have access to a supercomputer to do that stuff, right? And so here we have two extremes, right? And so we have kind of a really cheap um, you know, LPM models, and we have the really expensive high fidelity CFD, right? And so just to kind of draw an analogy for this. So let's say that, you know, let's say that you want to make yourself kind of a nice steak dinner, right? And so on the one hand, you can, um, let's say on the CFD side, you kind of make yourself like a really nice dry aged A5 wag kind of, kind of steak, right? And so the A5 wag is going to be delicious, you know, it's going to be, you know, um, awesome, but it also costs like seven thousand dollars a pound, and so you know you're off. You know, usually you know paying for rent is usually more important than 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 one A5 wagyu, right? Um, and so even though it's delicious, it's really expensive, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have LPMs, and a good analogy for this might be um, like a like a literal piece of cardboard. And so a, a piece of cardboard, you know, is going to be really cheap. You know, it's, it's not going to be very tasty, you know, no matter how much sauce you put on it or, or how you cook it. Because cardboard's going to be cardboard, right? Uh, but it's going to be cheap, right? Uh, and kind of kind of funny story about that, too. I, I had a friend in college who, uh, he, uh, you know, when he was in high school, he went to this uh, prep academy called Elite. Um, and apparently at, at Elite, they're very strict with, you know, how students can take breaks and stuff like that. And so there were times that he would get really hungry. Um, and, he, and they wouldn't allow him to like eat, like bring snacks or anything like that. And so what he would do was that he would, he would take a, like a pack of Arby's barbecue sauce. He'd put in, he'd keep it in his pocket. And then during class, what he would do is he would rip off pieces of paper from his notebook 
and then cover it with Arby's barbecue sauce and then eat that. And then that was kind of his way of, of eating while he was in the uh, SAT prep class. So, um, and so, you know, I, it's, uh, it's possible, you know, and he's, you know, obviously you know, still doing really well. He's, but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the kind of the, the lengths that people will do to, uh, you know, to feed themselves. It's kind of the kind of thing. Uh, okay. And so that, that's kind of the analogy that we have right now between LPMs and CFPs. And so, um, you know, it would be nice if we kind of had something that's kind of in the middle, uh, in the middle of, of these things, right? And so sometimes, you know, sometimes we don't want to shell out all the money for an A5 Wagyu. And, you know, and a lot of times we, we want to eat something that's tastier than a literal piece of card. Right? So there's this kind of really big area in the middle right here that's kind of unexplored in terms of modeling options, right? And that's where the 1D blood flow equations are going to fit in. So 1D blood flow equations kind of fit kind of in this range right here. Where in terms of computational costs, they're you know they're they're definitely more expensive than 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 LPMs, um, but they're going to give us much more accurate and much more uh, you know useful data than LPMs that we can use for for analysis. Yeah. All right, and so that's that's kind of, you know in terms of you know LPMs and CFPs, one I I just kind of wanted to show you guys where one D equations fit in. So you know they're going to be more expensive, and you'll see that they're they're more complex too than LPMs, um, but you know. They can still run on, on desktop computers. Um, it's just they, they take a bit of time. But that extra time that you put in uh, it really gives you a, a better amount of accuracy. Okay? And so this would be kind of you know um, like, like a weeknight steak dinner that you might make for yourself. Like maybe it's like a blank steak or something like that. Okay? So still delicious, you know, especially if you cook it well and you you season it well. Um, you know, but it's 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 you know um, not quite the same as like a like wedding, but still still really great on its own. And there's a lot of things that you can do with these one D equations. Um, that, you know, um, that are actually really, really useful, especially in terms of wave propagation that we'll see um, probably, probably starting next week. All right, so any, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, and so why, and so why do I call them the, the 1D equations? Okay. And so the, 1D, the reason we call them 1D equations is like this. So let's say that we have a vessel that might look like this. Okay. Right. And so the vessel could be curved, it could be any shape. Okay. And then along this vessel, let me draw the center line along that vessel. And so kind of like the same as the center line, um, you know, that you that we would draw, that we that you're drawing for your final projects in Sebastian. Right? And so let's say that the blood flow kind of flows along this uh, you know, this path. Like this. Okay. In the 1D equations, you know, what we're going to obtain. Is we're going to obtain um, curves for the flow and the pressure along this uh, center line. Okay. All And so the thing that results from this is that we're going to have excellent spatial resolution in the um, in the vessel direction or in the center line direction. And then what we're going to do is we're going to average out, you know, across the cross section. And so kind of the result of this that let's say that you know this we'll call this the z direction here. Okay. And so we have things like pressure. We might have something that looks like this. Okay. Or if we have flow, you know, the flow might go something like maybe like this. Okay. Um, and so the 1D equations, you know, it does a great job at, at providing spatial resolution in that flow direction. Okay. And a lot of times, you know, this is the this is the place where we want the most spatial resolution too, right? Um, because that's that's you know what we want to see is we want to track the blood we want to track pressure as it flows down the vessels right and so if we're going to pick a direction where we want to add you know spatial resolution it's going to be in that direction right and so that's what the 1D equations give us and so what you'll see is that you know when we when we derive the 1D equations the way that we're going to obtain them is that we're going to average we're going to average the Navier-Stokes equations 
across a cross section from the vessel. Or I should say, not average. Uh, we're going to integrate. We're going to integrate the Navier-Stokes equation across a cross section. Um, and so what results, and so, you know, once we do that, you know, and, and we're going to spend a quite a bit of time just, you know, going through that derivation. Uh, and then once you do that, you're going to obtain, um, you know, the 1D blood flow equations. Um, and then you can, we can solve those for, uh, for certain problems. Uh, and so the downside to doing the 1D equation is that because we're averaging across this cross section, so let me kind of give you a visual on what that looks like. And so we draw kind of a cross section of the vessel. So think, think of actually, you know, the segmentations that you're drawing in some vascular, right? So those are basically cross sections of your, of your vessel. And so what we're essentially doing is we're taking the equations of fluid mechanics and we're averaging it across this area that I've drawn here in, in green, okay? And so what, you, what happens there is that, you know, um, you know, we're gonna lose a lot of information across that direction. So thankfully, you know, there's not that much information that varies across that cross section. But one thing that is important that, that, that we're kind of losing out on is the wall shear splits, okay? And so that's kind of the one big weakness of the 1D equations that it doesn't compute wall shear stress all that accurately. Um, but even without wall shear stress, you know, there's, there's a lot of really nice things about the 1D equations, um, especially about wave propagation. Okay? And so, you know, kind of for the first time, you know, we, we've kind of talked about wave propagation kind of just in, in theory, but you'll actually see some computations and actually some simulations that kind of back up a lot of what we've, we've talked about with wave propagation. And so um, that's going to be one of the nice things about this 1D equations. All right, any questions on, on this so far? Our question, so could we obtain wall shear stress some other way? Yeah, so, so the way that you typically obtain wall shear stress in 1D equations is that you, you have to make some assumptions about uh, what the velocity profile looks like. Um, and, we have, and you'll see that we have to kind of do this anyway. Um, and so what we're basically going to assume is that the velocity profile looks parabolic. Um, and so you can, based on kind of the flow that you compute in the 1D equations, you can, you can use that assumption to compute the wall shear stress. Uh, but it's never going to be as accurate than as, as simulating the entire flow here, uh, which is what you which is what you get from CFD. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions on on this? Okay. All right. So let's uh, so let's do kind of a, a quick comparison here about uh, um, you know. Uh, how how this is going to um, to be for you know what what we're actually looking for in the one D equations. All right, so let's compare uh, with Navier Stokes. Right? And so when we solve the Navier-Stokes equations with CFD, uh, we're essentially getting four, um, four solutions at every minute. Right? And so these are kind of the primary solutions. And so I know, you know we've talked about wall shear stress, um, but you know, wall shear stress is known as what's called a derived quantity. So it, it's actually not the first thing that, that Simbasper solved for. And so the first thing that Simbasper solved for are the three components of velocity. Um, and pressure, okay? And so there's basically four unknowns that we have to solve for, and that's, that's kind of what makes things, that, that's part of what makes navier Stokes so difficult, that, you know, there's, there's so many unknowns to solve for. And so for the 1D equations, you know, we're gonna solve for the following quantities instead, okay? And so instead of the, um, the X, Y, and Z components of velocity, 
Uh, what we're going to be solving for instead is the flow. And we're going to denote that as Q of Z and T, right? And so that's flow as a function of Z, which is the um, spatial coordinate down the center line of the vessel, and T, which is time, okay? And the other thing that we're going to be solving for actually is cross sectional area. Because one thing that the one, because one thing that the one D equations um, doesn't assume is that it 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 doesn't assume that the walls are rigid. Okay, and so what you'll see, what we'll see is that you know one big advantage of the one D equations is that it allows for wall deformation. Okay, and it's kind of just a very natural part of, of solving the uh, of solving the solution. Okay, and so because our walls can deform, then our cross sectional area is also going to change, or it's something that we're going to solve. Okay, and this is due to uh, deformable vessel. And so those are the two primary things that we solve for. Um, but you know, we also have to solve, we also have to kind of have to solve for pressure. And so um, you know, pressure, pressure is here, but you know, what you'll see is that we'll we're gonna use um, something a little bit different to solve for pressure. So it's it's not explicitly solved for in the 1D equations. Uh, but we still we still want to know because you know pressure is an important thing for blood flow, and so even though you know pressure is not a primary variable, we st we still need to solve. Okay? So this is going to be plus pressure, okay? and so it's not quite part of the equations. And you'll you'll kind of see what I what I mean by that later. Our question: So are they are they rates? Um, and so no, these are uh, well the flow is kind of a, a rate, and so that's you know the uh, the volume per time. Uh, but the area is just going to be just raw area. Yeah. And pressure is just going to be just raw pressure. Okay. Yeah. So if you compare kind of these, uh, um, you know, these equations where Navier Stokes were, were solving for four unknowns at the same time, the 1D equations were only solving for, for two. And so that's, that's kind of one of the big simplifications here, right? So we're solving for less unknowns. Um, and so that's, you know, that's naturally going to be easier. Okay. Um, and so the, um, the downside to using um, these 1D equations um, that you'll see is that even though we're, we're going to be simplifying the Navier Stokes, we're still going to end up with a partial differential equation. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a big bummer there because PDEs are, are um, you know, pretty difficult to solve. And so we're still going to need to, you know, um, just like CFD, you know, we still need to rely on code um, to solve this PDE for us. And so it's, it's not something that we can implement on our own. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, later on, once, uh, you know, once we kind of finish with the derivation, I'll, I'll show you a code that uh, one of my colleagues prepared. Um, and that's, it's a nice one because it's, you know, it's relatively simple with just one vessel, um, but it's still a PDE. And so, you know, it's, it's not something that we can solve really by hand. It's, it's going to be a simpler PE than the Navier Stokes, but it's still a PE. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of one thing to kind of keep in mind is that, uh, you know, even though we're going to be doing all this work to simplify Navier Stokes, we're still going to end up with a pretty difficult equation to solve. Okay? And so in order to solve for this, um, we, need to, we need to use computer code. All right, and so that's kind of the introduction to you know what the one D equations are, you know how they fit, you know compared to other LP uh, to LPMs and CFD, um, and you know and what we aim to obtain. And so uh, for the rest of class today, and, and probably for part of um, Thursday too, uh, we're going to work on deriving the one D equations. Okay? And so it'll be a lot of math, a lot of assumptions, and a lot of um, um, derivation. But you know we're we're going to take it kind of slowly, kind of step by step. Um, but you know this derivation, you know. A lot of the theory and a lot of the conceptual understanding of what the 1D equations are kind of comes in the derivation. Um, and so normally, you know, I, I don't like to do very lengthy derivations like this in, in, in the class. And I kind of, you know, went kind of back and forth with this for a long time. But I think for these 1D equations, I, I think we need to see the full derivation or to really kind of understand kind of what it is. Because okay. I'm not going to be asking you guys to implement a 1D code in this class because that's, that's kind of a, a small kind of graduate project in, in by itself. 
Um, but you know, I, I do want you to kind of understand, you know, how we obtain certain things and, and what the different terms are. Um, okay, so any any questions on this before we dive into the derivations? All right, question. So we didn't uh, we didn't learn one D equations in fluids, right? And so it's not something that's traditionally learned in fluids. Um, probably what you've what you've done in fluids and, and kind of what we did kind of earlier in this class is we solved Navier-Stokes for one D in a one D context, and so where the flow is only going one direction, and so that's that's different than what we're going to be doing here. So. You know, uh, when I say 1D equations, what I mean is flow along the center line of the vessel. And so the vessel might kind of twist and turn and do all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, and we might have kind of constrictions within the vessel, but we just have one kind of spatial dimension. But the flow itself might be going in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you, you can actually apply the same methodology to do um, flow in any kind of flexible tube. Uh, you know, so if you want to do uh, if you want to simulate flow in your garden hose or something, um, you can use these equations for, for that as well. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and uh, start diving right into it. Okay, so now we're going to be deriving 1D. All right. And so our starting point for uh, deriving these 1D equations is going to be um, our Navier-Stokes equations. And so our Navier-Stokes, remember, is conservation of mass and momentum. Um, and we're going to put that in cylindrical equations. And we're going to make uh, one assumption here right at the beginning, um, just because you know this is kind of a standard one that we do for cylindrical natural stokes, and we're going to assume that the flow is axisymmetric. And I always spell this wrong. Axisymmetric. And what that means basically is that any derivatives with respect to theta or any derivatives with respect to the polar angle is going to be zero. And so as we're writing out these uh, these equations here, if we see any derivative with theta, we're just going to go ahead and cancel those out. All right, so let's start with conservation of mass. And so conservation of mass and cylindrical coordinates is, uh, looks like the following, right? So there's one over r, uh, partial partial r, of r u r, okay. where u sub r here is the um, velocity in the r direction or the radial direction, plus one over r partial partial theta of u sub theta, okay. plus partial u z partial z is equal to zero. Where u sub z, that's the flow in the um, in the axial direction or down the center. All right, so right away, you know, we see here that this middle term here has a derivative with respect to theta, and so let's go ahead and cancel this out. Okay. And the reason for that is, you know, again, because we we have our axisymmetric assumption. All right, so that's conservation of mass, right? and so we we have two terms that survive. Um, and you know, and I'll show you what we're going to do with those two terms in, in a second. Right? But first, let's write down the momentum equation, and let's simplify that. Um, you know, in terms of our, um, you know, using our our axisymmetric assumption. And so, remember, for the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, we have um, a, a momentum equation in each of the directions, and so we have one in the extra in the uh, um, for for cylindrical coordinates, we have one in the r direction. We have one in the theta direction and we have one in the z direction. Right? And so the momentum equation that we're going to be working with is the one in the z direction, so down, down, the, down the barrel of the, of the pipe. All right. And so it starts off with a partial derivative, derivative with respect to time. So we have partial uz, partial t, 
plus ur partial uz partial r plus u theta over r partial uz over partial theta. And so we're going to cancel out that term in a second because it has a partial derivative with respect to theta. All right. So then we have a uz partial uz partial z okay. plus. Uh, then we have the pressure term. Okay. This is equal to um, all the viscous terms. So we have the kinematic viscosity divided by r and partial partial r um, of r partial uz partial r okay. plus viscosity partial squared uz partial z squared okay. and then we have one more term with theta and so we have um, viscosity over r squared uh, partial squared uz over partial theta squared. Okay. All right, and so let's simplify this according to our assumption. And so any derivative that we see uh, with respect to theta, we're just going to cancel out. All right, so that one obviously is going to go away. And then this one also is going to go away. And so that makes our lives uh, slightly easier. So we still have kind of a we have quite a bit of proof ahead of us, um, but at least we don't have to worry about those those two terms. Okay. All right. Um, and so that's you know that's uh, Navier Stokes in the in symmetric proportion. So this is kind of a throwback to kind of the beginning of the semester when we kind of um, solved this um, kind of analytically for um, for kind of a simple case. Uh, but now we're going to kind of loosen up some of our assumptions before. Um, and then also integrate this equation so that we can manipulate it and get our 1D equations. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. And so, you know, before, before we start working with this equation, you know, I, I do want to just kind of briefly mention um, kind of where we're going and, and what we want to obtain, right? And so the idea with this equation is to manipulate them such that we only have two unknowns remaining. Right? And so those two unknowns should be the flow and it should be the area. Okay. Um, and so to do so, um, you know, we're going to make the following um, uh, the following consideration. Right, so this is considerations. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take these equations and then integrate them over the vessel cross-section. And the reason we do that is uh, is mostly to obtain flow, right? And so remember, the way that we obtain flow is that we we integrate the velocity across the center line um, or across the cross section, and that gives us flow, right? Um, and so that's kind of the primary reason we do that. But you can see what, what we'll see is that uh, you know that's going to give us a lot of other things as well. Right? right so the next one is an assumption, although it's it's a fairly valid assumption, is that uh, we're going to assume that the pressure is uniform across a cross section. Okay. And so, you know, the pressure doesn't doesn't change in space across that cross section. And, and this is kind of true in general. And so, you know, um, if you run your, your CFD simulation and you kind of slice your model kind of in between, what you'll see is that the pressure is kind of you know, mostly the same across that cross section. Okay. All right, number three. So number three is that uh, we're only going to consider the axial component of velocity. Okay. 
And so that's going to be UZ. UR is going to play a role, um, and that's that's going to basically define our wall motion. But uh, but primarily, we're only going to be interested in UZ. Okay. All right. And fourth, uh, you know, what we're going to be solving for or, or the unknowns in our solution um, are going to be the mean flow rate and the cross section. Okay. And so it, it seems like you know it, it's going to take a while because right now we don't have Q or A in our equations yet, and so you know it is going to be a fair bit of work in order to to get those quantities. But you know that's that's where we want to want to go. Okay. Oh, one other thing I, I should mention about these equations that that's different from what we did before was that these equations are, are going to be time dependent, right? And so when we solve for the steady flow in a rigid vessel, remember we we eliminated T from that equation, so we assume that the equation is more steady. Uh, but for these 1D equations, we're, we're not going to make that assumption. We're, and so we're going to allow the um, situation to be unsteady, um, which is really nice because in, uh, in blood flow, you know, because our heart is pulse time, it's kind of pumping and relaxing, pumping and relaxing, the blood never kind of, re it never really reaches a steady state. And so to have our equations be able to kind of change with time is, uh, you know, uh, is a really, really important thing. All right. And so, um, you know, kind of before we kind of continue on with the derivation, I want to talk about this for a bit. I kind of just discuss a bit, you know, why is area an unknown and why is it uh, significant, right? And so remember that the A here is, is kind of the cross-sectional area of our vessel. So, you know, if I draw kind of a vessel like this, right, uh, what can happen because, you know, because we know that our blood vessels are flexible structures is that this blood vessel can either expand or contract, right? And that's, it's going to just kind of naturally do that um, over the course of a, of a heart cycle, right? And so let's say that our vessel is kind of expanding to something like that. Okay. And so our cross-sectional area might kind of go up like that. And so, you know, the reason or kind of the significance of having area being unknown is that this, this uh, having an air, the area being unknown allows us to model um, deformable vessels in our, um, you know, in our, in our simulations. Okay. Um, and allowing the, and allowing to solve for wall deformation means that we can actually model wave propagation um, for the first time. Okay. Okay. And so this last one's significant because. You know, so far what we've covered in LPMs and with CFD, you know, we haven't been able to model wave propagation yet, uh, because in LPMs, you know, you can't really do wave propagation there because they're just they're just circuits. You know, there's you know there's there's nothing much you can do with that. And with CFD, um, you know, at, at least for probably what most of you guys are doing, you know, we need to assume rigid walls for that in order to kind of simplify our, our CFD. Um, and so right now, you know, there's we don't really have a method out there that can that can you know compute. And, uh, and model wave propagation pretty accurately. But the fact that you know, these 1D equations are gonna have the area here as an unknown will allow us to do just that. Right? And so this will, probably be, um, this will probably be the best model or the best um, equation that we're gonna have for wave propagation that we're gonna cover in this class. Um, and that's really significant because you know, wave propagation is something that's really important. It's just a lot of times it's really hard to kind of uh, work it into, into the equations especially the traditional kind of, you know, fluid mechanic engineering um, equations like Navier-Stokes. It's just not, it's just not a natural part of it. 
And so the fact that these uh, 1D equations will kind of will kind of kind of bake this in so naturally is, is kind of one of the really big advantages of this of this framework. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this? Question. Uh, question. So there is no streamline at the center. There is a streamline at the center. It's just uh, um, you know we're not going to be solving for that exact streamline. So we're going to be solving for how much um, volumetric flow rate is going to be passing through that that center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the flow the flow is going to go this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And so let's uh, let's go ahead and start jumping back into the derivation. Okay. Um, and so the next step, you know, now that we've written down our Navier Stokes equations and we've kind of eliminated some of the terms, is we need to apply some boundary conditions on the on Navier Stokes. All right, uh, and so let's let's start with uh, let's start with the no slip boundary condition at the vessel wall. Right, and so the no slip boundary condition basically says that the axial velocity or u z has to be zero at the vessel wall. Right, so that's fairly straightforward. And so that's something that we kind of uh, done before. Okay? Um, and so that's the axial velocity. Right? And so UZ. Um, but remember, you know, because we have a deformable wall, um, our radial velocity here is active. Right? Okay? Our, our radial velocity is denoted with UR. Right? And so if I, uh, let, me, let me just draw a diagram to kind of denote between the two. Right? So if you have a blood vessel like this, UZ is going to go down down the length of the vessel, and UR is going to go. UR is in the direction of the wall, so that kind of goes toward the wall or away from the wall. Okay, right. And so our boundary condition for UR, you know, because we we're assuming that this blood vessel can kind of deform like this. Okay, what we're going to assume for UR is that it's uh, um, the radial velocity is going to match the velocity of the wall. And so the way that we're going to do that is like the form. Right? So we're going to say that u r at r is equal to r is equal to partial r partial t, mm -hmm. where partial r partial t, and of course we're going to evaluate this at r is equal to r. This here is the is the wall velocity. And so with this boundary condition, you know, again, what we're saying is that the radial velocity has to match the, the velocity at the wall. Okay. Um, and so these are these are kind of important to keep in mind, um, you know, especially, especially as we start to as we start to integrate. Okay. All right. And so now we're gonna now we're actually gonna take our Napier Stokes equations and we're gonna integrate them across the vessel wall. And so before we before we embark on that journey, I, I do want to remind you, um, you know, what the expression for flow is. Right? Okay. And so this is this kind of harkens back to our um, our review of fluids when we talked about, um, you know, flow of steady flow of, of fluid in a, in a rigid vessel. Okay. And so our formula for Q, which is the volumetric flow rate of the blood is equal to 2 pi 
integral from zero to big R of uz, which is a function of r, times r d r. Right, and so this is this is just how flow is defined. Okay, and so flow is defined um, in kind of explicitly as this integral here. Okay? And so as we're going about then, and, and you know, um, integrating Navier Stokes, you know, I want you guys to re keep remembering this so that you know we can simplify some things for us. Okay? And so the first thing that we're going to do on the next page is take our equations for conservation of mass, uh, and then integrating that, um, you know, across the cross section. Um, you know, and, and you'll see that a lot of the terms kind of uh, simplify pretty rapidly. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so let's, uh, let's go ahead and start integrating conservation in maths. And so our conservation of mass equation, let me go ahead and write out the whole thing again. Okay. So we have partial uz, uh, partial z. Okay. And so that's one term. Um, I think I might have flipped the order on, on this one. Okay. And then we have one over r, um, partial, partial r of r u r. Okay. And all this is equal to zero. Okay. And so that's that's our conservation of mass equation that we had before. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take this equation and then integrate it, um, you know, across the cross section, right? And so we're going to basically take this, multiply it by two pi, okay, and then integrate it from uh, zero to big R of R dr. Okay. And we're going to do it for the same thing for this term too. And then we're going to work through this math a little bit, kind of massage these integrals, evaluate them, um, and then uh, use that to obtain our, our result. Okay. All right. And so let's kind of work on these integrals kind of one at a time. So I think that's that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the easiest thing to do. Okay. And so let me call this first integral here. So I'll call this integral one. Okay. And the second integral, I'll call this integral two. Okay. And so let's work on each of these kind of one at a time, because you kind of do too much at once, it becomes, you know, um, becomes more of a mess. Okay. Let's start with integral one. And so integral one, we have two pi integral from zero to r um, of partial uz, partial z, okay, r dr. All right, so what I'm gonna do is um, to kind of massage this is I'm gonna take that partial derivative with respect to z and kind of pull that out of the integral, okay? And so from this, we're gonna have partial partial z of two pi integral from zero to r um, of uz r dr, okay? Right, and the re and mathematically the reason I can do this is because all the other expressions in this in this um, you know um, in this uh, um, in this equation here don't depend on z. Okay, and so we can basically pull that partial derivative partial derivative with respect to z, pull it out of the equation without any consequence. Okay, all right, and that's nice because you know now what we have is this quantity in the parentheses here. Um, and this should look familiar to you guys based on what we had on the previous page is that what we have in this parentheses here, this is exactly Q, right? And so this first integral here, um, if we rewrite it, we can just rewrite it as partial Q, partial Z, okay? Uh, and so that's nice because that, that kind of simplifies things uh, you know, pretty significantly for us. Um, you know, and that kind of, uh, um, you know, helps out a little bit, okay. Okay, so that's the first integral that we have on there. And so now let's work on the second one, okay. And so the second one, we have two pi integral from zero to r 
big R, which is the uh, the radius of the vessel. Uh, maybe I should have said that earlier. So big R, that's that's kind of the the radius of the vessel um, itself. Then we have one over R, partial partial R of R U R times R D R. Okay. All right. And so the first thing that we notice here is that we have a one over R and an R right here. And both of those are outside the derivative. And so, you know, we don't have to worry about that. And so we can go ahead and just cross those things out. Okay, so they're gonna cancel out. And then what we have in the end is two pi, or after, after that, what we have is two pi, integral from zero to big R of partial partial R of R U R, okay, dr. Right. And so the next thing that we notice is that we have a partial R on the denominator here, and then a dr here, right? And so now these guys are going to cancel out, and then um, and then once those cancel out, then we can kind of just perform this integral pretty exactly just like just like that. Okay. All right. Any questions on um, on this so far? All right, and so in the end, or after that, what we have is two pi integral from zero to r of partial um, r u r, okay. And then now what we have here is the integral and the partial are going to cancel out, and so we have two pi r u r, and this is going to be evaluated from zero to r. Right? So it's kind of like we performed the integral, but you know we didn't actually have to perform a uh, an, an antiderivative. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it's it's like we perform this integral now, but we didn't perform the antiderivative because we have, uh, um, you know, we had that kind of partial um, partial there. Okay, um, and so now what we can do is we can just evaluate what's inside this parentheses at the two integration bounds. Okay. And so if we do that, we're gonna have two pi times um, this, this guy here evaluated at big R. And so we're gonna plug in big R in here for R. Okay, so there's gonna be R times uh, UR um, evaluated at, um, at R, okay. okay. Minus zero times you are evaluated at r is equal to zero. Okay. All right, and of course, you know, since this one is zero, we're just gonna cancel that out, okay? And we know what this is from our boundary condition. Okay, from our boundary condition, we know that this is equal. So this is the radial velocity evaluated at the vessel radius, okay? And we know that this is the same as the wall velocity. And so we can instead replace this with partial big R partial T, because right? that was our boundary condition. And so what we have here is two pi um, big R partial R partial T, okay? Right, and so that's the um, expression that we have left. Right? And what we can do from here is we can kind of bring everything inside the time derivative. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to use, um, I don't know if there's a better word for it, but uh, this is this is what I've always called it for, you know, um, my entire, I don't want to say my entire life because I, I didn't know that calculus was, was a thing when I came out of the womb, but um, for my, uh, ever since I learned calculus, this is what I've called it, right? And so the, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use what I call the reverse chamber. Right. 
So probably you, you've seen the chain rule in, in your previous math classes before. So now we're just going to reverse that process. Okay. And so what that looks like is the following. And so we have partial partial t of pi r squared. Okay. Um, and so if you perform chain rule on this, and so you take the time derivative of r, what you get is a two that comes out from taking the derivative of that times r. And then because of chain rule and because of r as a function of t, what you get is partial r partial t. So all I did was just kind of, you know, just kind of uh, did the chain rule and just reverse. Okay. All right. And so this form is really nice here because we have pi r squared. Um, and so this hopefully is familiar from your geometry class. This is our area. Okay. And so what we get from the second integral here is uh, um, instead of that integral, we have this partial A partial T. Right, so another relatively simple expression, and we can see that Q and A kind of um, come out just kind of really, really clean. Okay. All right, so uh, any questions on, um, on this so far? Yeah. So it's a lot of math, I know, and it's a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of kind of calculus and kind of weird kind of calculus rules, but um, you know, I, I, I want to go through this derivation slowly so that, you know, we can um, kind of see every single step um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I know it's, it's a lot of math to follow, but, um, you know, what I hope is that, you know, maybe, maybe not now, but maybe you go back and kind of watch the lecture later that you kind of, you know, and you read, of course, read the lecture notes as well, um, that you kind of, you know, see kind of every single step and kind of, you know, understand kind of why we do certain things. All right, and so um, now that we have both of those integrals, we can go ahead and put them together into one, okay? And so now our conservation of mass can be written in a uh, much nicer expression. Okay. And so now our conservation of mass is gonna be partial Q, partial Z, plus partial A, partial T, and this is equal to T. And so that's our new conservation of mass expression. And this is perfect right here, right? Because remember what we said was our goal was to kind of put everything in terms of Q and A, and that's exactly what we did here. And so right here, we can see that, you know, instead of having things in terms of the velocities, U, R, and U, Z, now they're in terms of Q and A. And so this is, this is great right here. This is kind of uh, good to go, okay? All right, and so that's the conservation of mass expression, um, you know, that we got from integrating um, Navier-Stokes. Now let's do that same thing. And so now let's do it to the momentum equation. And so this is this is the one that's going to be a little bit of a doozy. And so, you know, I think we'll start this here and then we'll kind of, uh, you know, uh, pick this up, definitely pick this up on, on Thursday. And so just like we did before, let me write out every single term of the momentum equation, and then we're going to multiply by 2 pi and, and integrate. Okay. All right. And so first, we have the unsteady term. So we have 2 pi and a row from 0 to r of partial uz, partial t, r dr, okay. plus 2 pi and a row from 0 to r of uz, partial uz, partial z, r dr, okay. plus uh, 2 pi, integral from 0 to r, of u r, partial uz, partial r, r dr, okay, plus um, 2 pi. Now we have the pressure term integral from 0 to r of 1 over rho partial p partial z r dr. Okay. And this is equal to our two viscous terms. And so we have 2 pi integral from 0 to r of nu over little r partial partial r. Um, 
times R partial UZ, partial R times R dr plus two pi integral from zero to R of new partial squared UZ partial Z squared R D R. Right? And so it's a doozy. It's a, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of terms here. Uh, but just like we did with conservation of mass, we're going to tackle this kind of one step at a time. Right? And so we're going to tackle kind of one integral at a time. So let me go ahead and label all these integrals. Okay. And so we have six integrals here that we need to work through. Right? And so probably get through the uh, maybe the first three today, um, and then we'll uh, we'll go over kind of the the rest of them here um, on Thursday. Um, but so far, oh, yeah, what's up? Just confirming that that's an equal sign between the integration yes. four and five. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's an equal sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for now, uh, you know, just kind of write everything down, um, you know, and then we'll tackle this kind of you know, term by term. Thankfully, the first the first two integrals here are, are fairly simple, um, you know, and the third third one will take a bit of work, but, uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll get through it all. All right, so any questions on um, on this? Okay. All right, so let's start working on integral one. Okay. And so this is this is actually very similar to our, our integral one on the um, you know for the conservation of mass, right? So it's gonna be two pi integral from zero to big R, partial U Z, partial T, R D R. Um, professor? Yep, what's up? Sorry, do you mind going back for a quick second? Sure. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm good, thank you. Yep. Uh, all right, so for this integral, uh, we're gonna do the same thing that we did for the first integral in conservation of mass. And so we're gonna take that time derivative and just kind of pull, pull it out. So we have partial partial T of, 2 pi integral from 0 to r of uz r dr, OK? And just like we saw before, this guy here is q, right? Because um, that's that's just how our flow rate is defined, OK? And so our first integral here is, is fairly simple. We just end up with partial q, partial t. Right. And so what this represents here is this represents just the, the time rate of change of flow. Right. Um, so pretty pretty straightforward relatively relatively. All right, so now let's do um, integral two. And so integral two, uh, we'll be able to work with this a little bit, but you know we're we're going to leave it in kind of a, in, in an awkward place, um, and you'll you'll, you'll kind of see why a bit later. Right. So integral two was a two pi times integral from zero to big R of u z partial u z partial z um, r dr. Okay. And what we're going to do here is, is kind of the same thing that we did for integral two last time, whereas I want to combine everything into the same z derivative. Um, and so what we're the, the tool that we're going to use to do that is the reverse chain rule. Okay. And so what we end up with is pi integral from zero to big R of partial partial z of uz squared r dr, okay. Okay. Uh, and we're just gonna leave it like this for, for now, okay? Uh, and so, um, you know, unfortunately right now there's there's not much more we can do with this term, um, but later on on Thursday, you'll see, you know, how we're going to deal with this because it's, uh, um, because uh, right now, you know, there's there's nothing, there's not much more we can do because we have uz squared, and that's that's kind of a weird thing to, to work with. But you know, we'll come back to this. But for now, we'll just kind of leave it like this. Okay. All right. 
And so uh, now let's work on integral three. So this is this is one of the more involved integrals. And so this is a you know this is a tough one here. Um, you know, and the primary reason it's tough is because it's right now it's in a form that we can't really work with because we have we have two two different velocities here because we have u r and u z. Um, you know, you can see right there. Okay, um, and so that makes things difficult. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get this into a different form uh, that we can uh, work with. My fiance's dad was just calling me just now. Okay, um, and so I'm going to do something that's that's a little bit out of left field here. And so it's uh, you know, um, I, I kind of this is kind of a, a trust a trust me moment, um, and so I'm going to give you basically the following expression. Um, that we're going to evaluate with the regular chain. Okay. All right. And so I know this is this is coming just completely out of left field, um, and unfortunately there there's not a better way to present this, but it's it's just kind of how it it, it is. Okay. And so let me um, make this expression. Here. So I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to r of r u r u z. Okay. And then we're going to evaluate this with with just regular chain. And so this is kind of forward, uh, forward chain. All right, and so we're just gonna do kind of one level of chain rule here. So first um, we're gonna take um, the um, kind of the derivative of the, of the last term, right? So we have R U R of partial Z, partial R, okay? And to this, we're gonna add um, kind of the other term associated with this. So it's going to be uz partial partial r of r u r. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason we're doing this is, uh, you know, um, is because we want to get another kind of a different expression or a different way to present the integrand for integral. All right, and so what we're going to do from here is we're going to take this term right here, um, this third term, and subtract this from both sides. Okay. All right. And then that's going to uh, lead us to um, you know something uh, something a bit nicer. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this so far? Okay. All right. And so we do that, then we end up with the following um, expression here. Right. So we have R. U R. Partial U Z partial R. This is equal to. Partial partial r of r u r u z minus u z um, partial partial r um, of r u r. Okay. And so this is just the same expression that we had before, except I subtracted that third term from both sides. Okay. All right. And so from here, you know, we're going to do a little bit more work here, and that we want to simplify this term. Um, using our original conservation of mass equation. Okay. Uh, and so this is kind of the original conservation of mass before we, we performed any integration, right? And so if you remember what that looked like, it, it looked like this. So you have partial u z, partial z plus uh, one over r, um, partial partial r of r u r, okay? And this is equal to zero. And, and so from this expression, what we can say 
because this, what we can say is that this, this guy right here looks very similar to what we have up here, right? And so let's go ahead and uh, um, and kind of solve for that in this expression. And so what we what we have from continuity is that partial partial r of r u r is equal to minus r partial u z partial z. Okay. And so this is really nice because now we've kind of taken this expression here and we've kind of eliminated um, R from, from it uh, or UR, right? And so we're basically kind of making a swap for UR and, and UC, okay? And having everything in terms of UC is, is really nice because then that kind of fits fits together kind of really well, okay? And so if we make this substitution here, uh, what we have then is the following. And so what we have then is UR, um, oh, R U R, sorry. Partial U Z, partial R, okay, is equal to partial partial R of R U R U Z um, plus um, R U Z partial U Z partial Z. And uh, you know it, it looks it looks um, you know um, still a little bit intimidating, um, but believe it or not, this is um, this is going to be a lot better to work with, right? Because what we have here on the left, this is right now this is the integrand that's in um, integral three. Okay. And so now what we can do is we can replace that integrand uh, with what we have uh, what we have here. Okay. Um, okay. And so let's go ahead and plug this in. Plug in the right hand side. Okay. And to integral three, and then what we end up is the with the, is the form. Okay. And so we have two pi integral from zero to r of partial partial r of r u r u z dr okay plus um, two pi integral from zero to big r of r u z partial u z partial z dr All right. Um, and so now, now that we're at this point, um, you know, we have two things here that we can work with, you know, much more easily. Um, you know, which which doesn't seem like it because it seems like we've taken a, a difficult integral and made it worse. Um, but these guys, you know, believe it or not, are, are actually you know, pretty nice because okay. this this first integral, what we can see here is that we have this dr. It's going to cancel out with that dr, and now we just have kind of a straight up integral for that. And then this guy right here, you know, this looks identical to integral two, okay? Right. And so on the next page, I'm going to go ahead and finish up the uh, um, the derivation for this integral, um, and then we'll kind of wrap it up for, for today. Okay. Um, so before I do that, are there any questions on on this? All right, and so uh, evaluating that first integral, what we have is two pi r u r u z, okay? Evaluate from zero to r, okay? And then for the second integral, um, we're gonna do the same thing we did for integral two, which is our reverse chain rule. And so we have um, pi plus, uh, or pi times integral from zero to r of partial partial z u z squared dr, and then what you'll see from this integral here is that it completely goes to zero, right? Because we know that uz at r is equal to r is equal to zero, okay? And this was our no-slip boundary condition, okay? 
And also when we plug in zero for big R, this also goes away. And so all that we're left with from integral three is actually the exact same thing as integral two, right? And so integral three is gonna be pi times integral from zero to big R, partial partial Z of uz squared dr. So this third integral, you know, I, I know was kind of a lot of work and a, and a lot of kind of stretches that we kind of had to make, but, you know, we end up with kind of the same thing, right? Uh, and mathematically, it, it's kind of poetic that this kind of ends up the same as integral two, because integral two and integral three, they kind of are born from the same place. And so, you know, if you think back to our Navier-Stokes equation, both integral two and integral three come from our convection term. Um, and so the fact that, you know, they both come from convection and they both kind of end up the same, is kind of you know poetic in kind of a way. Okay. Um, all right. So, any final questions on on this before we wrap it up for today? All right. So that's all I got for today. And so we'll, we'll pick this up on Thursday again, and we'll uh, do the last three integrals. And so thank you guys for uh, um, for coming today. Um, and so have a great evening, everyone. Um, you know, definitely uh, keep working on your projects. Um, and I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Professor. Yep. Um, in orange, uh, where we have uh, partial or partial R mm -hmm. parentheses R U R. Yep. Um, to the right of that, is that negative new? Or no, R? that's uh, that's negative R. Sorry. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I did was I, I basically took this continuity equation, multiplied both sides by R to cancel that out, and so we have R times partial U Z partial Z. Um, and then I subtracted from both sides because I, what I wanted to solve for was this quantity in right here that I'm circling. Um, because that's that's what we kind of have up there in that equation. Yep. And you said uh, two and three are equal because they're both convection terms in the Navier Stokes equation. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. they both uh, yeah, they both they both they both kind of represent that, that convection term. So it, it unfortunately it's a bit difficult to see from uh, uh, from cylindrical coordinates, but both, you know, integral two right here, we basically had uz times partial uz partial z, and this ur partial uz partial r. Uh, both of those are the convection terms of Navier Stokes, and so that's uh, that's basically showing that you know the velocity can change with with space, basically. Yeah. Um, is is the convection terms the they're not those aren't the accumulation right? or production, but I, I remember you, you named it, you phrased it away in our, the fluids course. Um, ah, yeah, so those, I would say this, these are the, uh, these are the carrying terms actually. And so this would be carrying. kind of like, um, yeah, these are kind of like the deposits and withdrawals that we had um, from before. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Navier Stokes is kind of weird because it's, it's basically a, a, a transport equation for velocity, um, but that velocity that it's transporting is also the velocity that's been transporting. And so, what the convection terms, you know, oftentimes we call those the nonlinear terms is because the velocities can also carry itself, you know, to, to other places. And that's, that's kind of the, that's kind of what the convection term represents that the same velocities that's carrying stuff can also carry momentum as well. And so it's kind of a weird kind of thing. And that's, that's kind of what makes, that's the main reason Navier Stoke is so difficult for me to solve is, is exactly those convection terms. Yes. Okay. All right, Professor. I'll, I'll probably have more questions, but I gotta digest all this <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I know, but it's uh, yeah. So it's a, I know it takes a while to digest, but yeah, let me know. If, let me know if you have any questions on it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah.